what does it mean to think about Twitter as theater? So we can see Professor Graham is appropriately dressed for this evening's topic. The topic that she's going to share with you today is a particular favorite among students who took our Introduction to Digital Intelligence class um, this past fall, and it's offered every fall. In addition with us this evening, we have Alyssa Day, who's a sophomore English major and linguistics minor, and also a member of my student advisory council. And she'll be sharing with you thoughts about being a student at Stony Brook, as well as a student in Professor Graham's class. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to you, Professor Graham, and take it away. All right, any sound you hear in the background is my cat playing with the skull. Uh, let me share my screen. And slideshow. All right, hello world. Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> art and technology, about, you can hear me, right? Today we're going to talk about art and technology, about how the history of art informs the history of technology. We're going to talk about the ways in which aesthetic exploration can proceed and even bring about technological application. Now the frame for this discussion, when I give a longer version of it in a programming class in the fall, is a hands-on homework assignment, which is that the students learn how to program a Twitter bot. The class is co-taught by me and a computer science professor. I can program, he knows a ton about the humanities, it's a really effective partnership. To jump right into it, what does it mean to think about Twitter as theater, to think about activity on Twitter as theatrical performance? It would mean, first of all, to think of brevity of the super short formats of social media platforms like Twitter as a meaningful theatrical condition. We seem to be in an age in which short forms have risen from minor to major cultural commodities. In just the past decade, super short writing and videos have become a major form of entertainment online. Twitter's 280 character stories, YouTube's mini movies, Vine and TikTok's looping short dramas, and other super short storytelling forms on Facebook, and Instagram and every other social media platform. Now, this is a fairly new condition of communication. The platforms that I just named date back to no earlier than 2003. And TikTok, which is a video platform the kids here may know about and the parents may not, only became mainstream in 2019. But the super short drama has a longer history on the public stage than we may think. In an article assigned in the readings for this class, and you did do the readings, didn't you? John Muse, a theater historian at the University of Chicago, takes up the genre of the long play in the, the short play in the long 20th century. Uh, Muse argues that brevity should be considered a distinct mode of theatrical practice, that the short play should be considered distinct from the long play, just as the short story is considered distinct from the novel. In the arts, length is not just length. The literary critic Luke Menand makes this point when he says prose fiction is not a continuous bolt of cloth cut to various lengths. It's a very diverse body of forms. The members of a category cannot be arranged according to some neutral measure like length, which would be like categorizing the members of a family of people by height. They can be arranged only by substance, as we naturally categorize people, even and especially people in the same family, by character. In other words, the short story isn't just a story with a different length from a novel. They're actually very different beasts. The same goes for a film and a super short video on TikTok or a long theatrical performance versus the kind of fragmented performances you find on Twitter. What is theater? Theater is dramatic performance for an audience. It's what takes place between the spectators and the actor. You begin to see how theater historians could find appeal in social media. Social media is a new form of dramatic performance for an audience. Because theatrical shorts compress dramatic beats into small space, they're often meta-theatrical, either explicitly or by implication. What is meta-theater? It's theater about theater. The consumption of theatrical shorts is usually confined to what Muse calls the microthon, the long compilation of short plays. On the stage, theatrical microthons are performances of an hour or more that comprise anything from a half dozen to hundreds of shorts. Platforms like Twitter and TikTok are programmed as microthons. You don't watch one TikTok video or read one tweet. You consume a few dozen at a time. 
other theatrical elements that super short theater shares with social media is exaggerated surprises, reversals, and violence, a devaluing of character in favor of plot, dramatic progressions that emphasize endings, and a concomitant tendency toward comedy. Specifically, a style of comedy that we could call existential comedy, a term used by the philosopher Agnes Heller to refer to comedy that takes absurdity as natural. The devices of existential comedy include a lot of non sequiturs, surprising reversals, and the actualization of multiple meanings of figurative language. You also get an overwhelming effect of too much information and of unalike things packed together into a very tight space. On the internet, people tell jokes in this style because these jokes respond to what life is like on the internet, what life is like in a world or on a platform where everything is available at once. It's important to remember, though, that artists were working up this style for decades before technologists codified it on the level of social media platforms. In class, we would talk about the reduced Shakespeare company, the New York neo-futurists, the sketch comedy of Saturday Night Live or Key and Peele, among many others, the work of improv troops like the Upright Citizens Brigade, and the work of major professional playwrights like Susan Laurie Parks or Kenneth Koch. Koch was writing microthons of super short plays well before social media. And he said his inspiration for it came from watching television. He said, I can switch from one channel to another and be in the middle of three different movies. And in 30 seconds, I could be laughing or crying at what I saw. And I wanted to get that part of the drama, that part of theater on stage. Muse says, microthons have gained popularity and prominence because they reflect and recreate the information overload that characterizes contemporary experience and urge simultaneously to break the world into comprehensible bits and to make everything available at once. That's the trajectory I'm trying to take you on. Philosophical preoccupation, artistic intuition, technological application. The social media theater of the 21st century models what life is like on a platform where everything is available at once. Vine creators, for example, seem to be perpetually tickled that so many separate cultural domains exist in the same world pop music and politics, depression and sitcoms, club music and school choirs, heartbreak and heart healthy breakfasts, high school and celebrity, 80s culture and contemporary culture, song relationships and real relationships, Sesame Street and insecure employment, RoboCop and police brutality, what children know and what adults know. The experience of tacking desperately between these domains feels a little bit like growing up. It also suggests the restless disorganized world of the internet where something completely different is always just a click away. I've come to wonder whether the triumph of short forms on the internet can help to explain certain features of the internet culture at large. Short forms online register the weirdness and incongruity of the mass consumption they enable. The existential comedy that prevails on so many microthon platforms, the perpetual creation of a world in which absurd events and weird juxtapositions are taken for granted is a way of riffing on a world where everything is available at once. To summarize, it's useful to view the culture of Web 2.0, not just as a product of technology, but as a product of storytelling and the theatrical arts, as technological application has finally caught up with artistic intuition. We can find lots of historical examples of patterns of exploration and consumption in the arts driving technological change. For example, in the history of cinema, uh, Manan points out that we had the technological pieces necessary to make films for a long time before we started making films. Manand argues that cinema, the moving picture format, arose when it did because artists and audiences felt more attuned to its distinctive aesthetic in those years than we had before. He says, we might call the invention of cinema an episode in the history of narrative. Not the history of technology, the history of narrative. When Menand describes cinema as an episode in the history of narrative, rather than just an episode in the history of technology, he means that the aesthetic and epistemological preoccupations of cinema were gaining currency in storytelling even before artists seized on the storytelling possibilities of film. He goes on to talk about those preoccupations, which we'll skip here. The point is that he believes that in the case of cinema, the work of artists inspired the work of the people who designed and invested in a certain kind of technology. Aesthetic exploration preceded technological application. Once again, in the arts, length is not just length. Short form theater has different theatrical conventions from long form theater, just as the short story has different literary conventions from the novel and different philosophical preoccupations and different aesthetic effects. 
What I'm trying to say is that Tumblr and Twitter and Vine and TikTok also represent an episode in the history of narrative, an episode in the history of theater, which is why so many theater historians love to write about it. Why do I care about this? I mean, as a teacher, why am I putting so much emphasis on the idea that the arts often inform technology, not the other way around? Because a lot of the people in this class, assuming this is one of the meetings for IAE 101, a lot of the students in this class are going to major in computer science. And they need to understand the importance of learning about the arts as they learn to become coders and builders and technology leaders. Computers are simply machines that imitate other machines. Because of this, computers have never been intrinsically destined through some internal logic of the technology to go in any one direction or to be any one thing. Rather, the shapes that computer hardware and software have taken historically reflect the agendas and norms and artistic commitments, even if those artistic commitments just meant they were really into the grateful dead of the groups of people who sought to do things with computers. You need to learn about people and art and culture, or you're going to misunderstand not only the history of computing, but also its present and its future. In this case, you need to learn some things about theater if you want to understand the past and future of online platforms for theatrical performance. So that's the wisdom I wanted to drop on you kids today. I wanted to tell you about the larger theatrical history into which performance on social media fits, and to remind you that the history of storytelling the aesthetic and philosophical preoccupations of storytellers can be as important for understanding how to ride the wave of technological change as the plain old history of technology. In a full length class, I would also talk about the ways in which we experience Twitter, even though the tweets themselves are short in terms of a long duration of time. For instance, when we follow a single person for a long time and witness a sustained exposition of character. One of the things that Twitter bots teach us when those Twitter bots are presenting, for instance, a data set over an extended period of time is that we can arrange to engage with data sets in a lot of different ways. And the rather more human experience of engaging with a data set bit by bit over an extended period of time will enable you to understand the character of that data set in different ways than you would otherwise. In this respect, a Twitter bot or a regular Twitter account can be not a microdrama with characters shrunk to a scribble, but a sustained exposition of character in Hamlet-like complexity. The actor, as he takes us through each mood and turn of his role, shows us sides of the character that we had not expected to find, and reminds us of how we may differ, either deep down or eventually, from the roles that we thought we had been called upon to play. So that's it. Thank you so much. Um, let me now turn it over to Alyssa to um, maybe first comment on what you most liked about this class and then tell us a little bit about your experience at Stony Brook. So when I took this class, I took it in my freshman year of my fall semester. Um, and unlike how Professor Graham said that most students in the class are majoring in some sort of computer science. I'm an English major, so to say that I was concerned that I couldn't, you know, complete the assignments was, is an understatement, but honestly, I found a lot of value in the class because I feel like sometimes people find that the humanities and sciences are so divided between one another. Um, I learned how it was really meshed so well together and they were like completely blended and on top of it, I have, you know, relatively a good handle on Python, which is a program, which I didn't have before, um, which I think kind of just like speaks well to the whole college experience about how, you know, you may not know what to expect and sometimes it can be challenging, but you reap a lot of benefits from the experience um, and you learn a lot that you don't expect that you would. Um, and on behalf of my Stony Brook experience, um, the reason I chose Stony Brook was actually because my cousin had gone here and I was so confused on where to go. And he was like giving me like a sales pitch, even though that's totally not his personality. He was like, Alyssa, you're not gonna believe, you know, like Stony, he, he was describing Stony Brook as an Ivy League school for a SUNY price. And he kept saying it and I was like, what Corey like I feel like that's crazy to say about a SUNY and he was like no I'm not kidding and he was he's uh he was a history major um and he was telling me about how close he had gotten with um 
his professors and how you know dedicated the staff was how dedicated the student body is um and how driven everybody is here and i noticed that when i because i'm a very ambitious person driven as well so that really caught my attention so i did commit here among other reasons they had the program i wanted to be an english teacher um but i knew this was the environment for me when I stepped onto Stony Brook and noticed that everyone else around me was just as driven and wanting, eager to learn, eager to be involved. And um, it was one of the best decisions I made because I love it here. And I've gotten involved in a lot of things on campus and I couldn't speak more highly of this school, honestly. Well, thank you. <laughs> and to bring it back around to the course program that we're talking about, and I'll provide a, a few more details on that in a second. How did taking that class make you think differently about being an English major or being an English teacher, which is your future career? Um, you know, as I was saying before, I really saw the world as being so divided between STEM and humanities. I literally, because uh, obviously Stony Brook is a strong STEM school, and my roommates and everyone around me was taking biology. And I was like, I'm not a STEM kid. I'm not a STEM kid. I'm not a STEM kid. And my roommate said to me, she was like, Alyssa, you are taking digital intelligence because I was telling her about the course. She's like, you are getting a tech requirement out of this, meaning like you are completely immersed in this um, class that is, you know, both humanities and STEM. And um, you know, it, it taught me that there's a lot of value in disciplines other than your own, and that you are, totally can learn from, you know, other disciplines, other areas that can impact your own knowledge. I didn't, I, I wouldn't be the one to say that I thought that English and the humanities kind of inform technology, I would think possibly the other way around. Um, so not only did it make me be proud to be an English student, um, but it also as I was saying before, shows how well blended everything is um, and how even if you are a student that say is geared one way, me being a humanities student, I still had the ability to learn something that I thought I was completely incapable of learning. So well, we, we call it the humanities because we're all humans, right? So it's right. Sort of studying about the human condition. Um, but you mentioned something which might be a little bit code internal jargon because we know Stony Brook, but you said tech is a requirement. You wanna expand on that a little bit um, and what you meant by that. Um, so at Stony Brook, on top of your own major requirements or minor requirements, what have you, um, there are uh, gen, gen ed requirements, which are called SBCs, which is an acronym for Stony Brook curriculum. Um, and it's meant to open up all of you prospective students um, to different disciplines. There's a variety, there's arts, technology, um, diversity, um, there, there's some global, like there's so many things. Writing, and, math, writing. Um, <laughs> there's <yeah>. like <laughs> so many, I can't remember. Um, and, you know, all of which give you an opportunity to kind of find your path. Um, and I think it's especially, it's valuable to everyone, even if you know exactly what you want to do. I knew from the get-go I wanted to be an English teacher, that I was in, in it for the literature and the writing, but honestly, um, it's really broadened my perspective, and um, I'm 100% sure we'll do the same for you. I mean, Lyle, I don't know if you want to add something to that from your experience as an admissions counselor. and. Yeah, well, um, actually, we're getting some really good questions popping up. Um, oh, good. So, um, uh, we got a question here, here for Alyssa. Alyssa, um, the student wants to know, how do you balance the course load with a major and a minor? Is that a challenge to do so? Um, I, so obviously, college and high school are two worlds apart. They are not the same. Um, high school, you're taking back-to-back -back classes. College, you have hours in between certain classes. 
Um, and the adjustment and assimilating into college, that can be difficult. But once you step into routine and Google Calendar is your best friend, in my opinion, I use it all the time. Break up your time, um, set time aside to study. And you know, you'll know you find that you're right in place in a routine. Also, um, advising on campus is very helpful. Um, obviously having a major and a minor can seem daunting, um, but you know, you meet with your advisor of your major and they really tell you the exact steps of what you need to do for you in order for you to finish on time. And you will find um, if you, you know, remain disciplined and work in a timely manner that you will have free time. I, I have my own social life and I ha I'm a part of a lot of other clubs and activities and positions as well. Um, and I still find myself you know, being able to scroll on TikTok for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or so. Um, so it's just a matter of time management, which you'll all learn is the most, one of the most important practices that you can have in college. I, I think it's worth, oh, sorry. Can uh -huh. I just follow up on that? Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that, um, for example, an English major of your 120 credits at most a third of them are actually in English and then some general education requirements, but there's actually quite a, a bit of breadth there for electives that you could fit in a minor um, or, you know, the same is true. Uh, I know a lot of people are interested in pre-med curric type curricula, the BA in biology actually requires a minor. And so that major, the BA in biology is configured to give you the space to take the minor. So it's not extra credits beyond the 120. It all fits within that 120 credits that is sort of the standard amount that you do in four years to graduate. I'm sorry, Lyle, you were gonna say. No, no, sure. Um, to, uh, the student had another question about um, being that we are such a, a prestigious research university. Um, somebody wants to know, can they do research here as an English major? Can they get their hands-on experiences that they're looking for? Um, anybody on the panel can take this. Professor Graham, why don't you take that one? <laughs> we have students do research all of the time. Um, and we have, uh, we have people working on really interesting projects. We always have a need to have, uh, to have student minds, student bodies working on things. We basically kidnap them out of the hallway and say, you're working on my projects now. Yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities for students to get engaged in research at Stony Brook, even if maybe especially if they're an English major. Um, I work in a field called the digital humanities, uh, which brings together um, the tech side of things with the humanities side of things. So if you're more interested in a project that could lead you to, um, to a graduate degree or work for a tech company, even as an English major, you could do that kind of work at Stony Brook. Right, and we have, um, you know, so I just talked about the 120 credits, the research courses that you might enroll in to do research with somebody like Professor Graham will count as credits toward your degree. Um, but we also have uh, summer research programs, something called Eureka, which provides a small stipend to do research over the summer. There are many opportunities. Um, various types of fellowships that students can apply for to do independent research um, that involves travel. Uh, so those are some of the more um, compensated forms of doing research. You know, there are a lot of programs out there um, that pay fellowships or stipends to do that sort of thing. Um, is it hard to change majors? Uh, I would say within the College of Arts and Sciences, no. Um, we were talking about the general education requirements and those apply to any major. So that's one of the great things. You don't lose work, you know, uh, credits earned still accrue to a new major. Uh, the, the one type of major that it is difficult to change into is in engineering because they have very explicit um, stacked curricula and uh, it, it separate admissions requirements. So for example, you can't, it's not easy to come in as an English major and become a computer science major. You would have to really declare that at the outset.
We've got a, a good question here. It says, um, can a panel talk more about how I can go about doing interdisciplinary studies if I want to major in English, but I also really have an interest in technology? You have to do this one, don't I? Yes, you get to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, look, this is something that the faculty themselves are super interested in. And, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, 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 you'll get great advising from the faculty on this matter, partly because we ourselves are interested in doing research that crosses exactly that kind of boundary. Um, so we can help to set you up with an advising or a mentoring situation with mentors from both the English department and from uh, one of the more technically oriented departments, for example. Um, and we can help to make sure that the questions that you're exploring as a, as a student are not just questions that you yourself are interested in, but questions that um, are part of the field of English literature that you want to study that, that, uh, that, are questions that haven't been asked before and that really contribute something meaningful. So um, as, a, as a procedural matter, it's not, it's not that hard to do to bring together um, study in a tech field with study in something like English at Stony Brook. I think the real value added that Stony Brook brings is really dedicated faculty who are going to make sure that you don't get lost on that journey and who make sure that you develop in the direction that you want to develop in. And Professor Graham on a, a completely unrelated but not perhaps even more important, somebody wants to know what the name of your cat is. <laughs> the name of my cat is Theo. He is a failed foster and uh, <laughs> I, I wish he could have gotten more screen time, but but uh, he's off hunting imaginary mice. <laughs> uh, we have uh, an, another question here. It's a looks like a pretty uh, well thought out, uh, deep question. The student has a question: Do you examine the truthfulness or lack of realness in social media content? Meaning, technology wants us to present allows us to present what we want to present, not really what is real, so. Uh. Yes, we do. And actually we're developing a course that's almost completely centered around that called the Internet and the Open Society that talks about things like disinformation, misinformation, and how not just uh, questions of um, citizenship and communication and truthfulness online, but also how builders and creators can help to build better platforms. Uh, for making sure that the truth sifts out on the internet. So this is the sort of thing that we're engaged in curricular development uh, to, to, to help the students better explore. And it's things where we're already asking those questions in, in classes. They're great questions. So I have a question. I think we've got different panels. So let me um, take a stab at this one on getting master's degrees and how would you do that? And um, there are various ways. We do have some accelerated master's degrees and I can uh, in a minute when I can't type and talk at the same time, but I'll try to post a, a link for you. Um, so that's one way to do it. And what an accelerated master's degree is, is in five years, uh, you earn both the bachelor's and the master's. So you earn the bachelor's degree after four years, but in that fourth year, you've already started working on the graduate courses for the master's. I'd say the most common of those are uh, with an MBA, so a master's in business. Um, but we also have a couple of accelerated degrees that are combined with the master's in public health. So I know there's another question here about the public health route. Um, we do not have a major specifically called public health at the undergraduate level, but we do have um, many majors that are associated with that. And in fact, earlier this evening, we talked about the globalization studies major and one of the tracks in that major is, is fairly public health oriented um, because what distinguishes public health from say straight up medicine is thinking about the cultural and political context that you have to work in to bring that um, we are, we're living in it in a pandemic, right? It's, it, having a vaccine is not enough. There are a lot of uh, governmental and administrator um, and manufacturing and distribution issues that have to be addressed. And so that's in the larger sphere of public health. Um, 
for going into the health sciences professions, there are many different ways to do that. In fact, believe it or not, quite a common route is the English major um, because of these attributes that we talked about earlier. Of If you think of 120 credits and a normal course is three credits, so you're taking 40 something courses in the course of your undergraduate degree, if only a, a third of those are English courses, then you have a lot of space in your schedule to take the biology um, and chemistry and math. Um, those are fitting some of your general education requirements at the same time. But those are, those are the disciplines that one needs in order to gain entry into medical school. And remember that the medical school standardized test that you take in order, you know, the MCAT, which is the equivalent of the SAT for medical school, also has lots of content on psychology and sociology and ethics. Um, and those are all pieces of education that you acquire during your general education. So pre-med isn't a major, it's a, com it's a congregation of education that you acquire as part of a major and you have several choices. Um, probably one of the most popular at Stony Brook for obvious reasons is the bachelor's degrees in biology. And there are a couple of different ways to do that. The BA in biology, um, I mentioned it earlier, allows you to, to minor in something that's very complementary and creates a little bit of space by not having quite so many upper division laboratory requirements. So you can expand your breadth in that way. So those are all good ways to get into the health field. We also have a health sciences major which is not to go to, into medical school, but health related professions. So say you want to be a radiology, you know, a imaging technician to run MRIs, uh, things like of that nature, then the health sciences major lets you three years in the, the basic sciences. And then the fourth year is in that applied health technology. Um, so let me stop there and um, Lyle, what's the next question? Whoops, you're muted. <laughs> so um, there are people who want to major in English with the goal of becoming um, an English teacher, which Stony Brook does offer that uh, certification program. For a student who does do that, when would they begin taking those uh, teacher education courses? We should let Alyssa answer that. <laughs> yes, just gonna say. Um, so currently I'm a second semester sophomore. So last semester, so in my third semester, I applied into the English education program, um, which was referred to me by the advisor from the English department. And afterwards, after I got in, um, he bas I basically started taking uh, education courses right away. Um, so currently at this moment, I'm enrolled in a special education course. Um, so while you complete the English major, you are simultaneously taking education courses, which will eventually allow you to uh, student teach, which is required by New York State to get your certification. Um, and there is also an English education advisor who's, uh, who works with the English advisor. His name is Dr. Mangano. He is very much on top of things, advises us what to do, tells us what to do so we get things done in a timely manner. Um, but you really would not start anything English education related until um, your sophomore year. Um, but also about the master's program, I am going to apply into the accelerated track for getting an English master's, which, uh, you know, for some is recommended when you teach. So that's another thing I could do simultaneously while also being in the English ed program. So it's a great opportunity. Um, and the accelerated track is actually a major reason why I did come here. Um, because, you know, a lot of schools don't offer that, but it is a very good option here at Stony Brook. So Um, Professor uh, Graham, um, somebody wants to know if if you attended Stony Brook and if you did or you didn't, um, what brought you to want to teach 
at Stony Brook? Uh, I didn't attend Stony Brook. I attended uh, I attended a collection of other schools, um, but Stony Brook wound up being a really great fit for me as a teacher. So uh, for my own education, um, I was uh, learning. I, I was uh, mm, I was training in my field, the digital humanities, at the same time as the field was forming. It's an extremely recent field, so I found myself pinballing back and forth between. You know, some some schools that did liberal arts stuff and MIT, which does more technical stuff. What I found at Stony Brook was a place where I could bring both of those together, both in my research and in my teaching. Um, Stony Brook has opened up a lot of opportunities to help to develop um, students who are incredibly competent um, on the technological side of things, but who are also literate and amazing and interested on the humanities side of things. And to be perfectly honest, I think that's exactly the kind of builders and makers that we need to be training for tomorrow. Um, it's increasingly clear that we can't just, um, you know, build algorithms without having any understanding of ethics, for example. Um, it's perfectly clear that we can't just uh, throw, you know, throw a facial recognition system at a police department and expect everything to go just fine. Um, there, there's. Um, there's a, a human component to everything and especially to computing. As I said earlier, computers are just machines that imitate other machines. Sometimes the machine that they're imitating is human psychology with all of its biases, with all of its norms, um, with all of its peculiarities. And unless we understand people, unless we understand culture, then we are going to find that um, digital, the digital world is flying out of our control at an ever faster pace. So Stony Brook seemed to me like the perfect place both to do the kind of research that I wanted and also to do the kind of teaching that I feel is essential. Uh, here's an interesting question. It says, um, I'm interested in digital intelligence. What software or program should I be familiar with? You don't have to be familiar with anything when you take the course, we'll teach it to you. Um, we usually do Python. Uh, but that's not so different from C++, that's not so different. Once you learn a programming language, the others are just fine, you know? Um, come on in, you don't have to familiarize yourself with anything beforehand, but we have a lot of students who come in already familiar with things and they're just building types of tools like poetry generators that they don't build in computer science courses. Um, if you wanna make a bot that uh, reproduces um, new works of Shakespeare that Shakespeare himself never wrote, Good news, we can help to teach you to do that. Uh, those are all the questions we have right now. So I don't know if anybody else has anything they'd like to add. On the TikTok side, I want to brag that I was into sea shanty TikTok before that became popular. I was one of the leaders in that revolution and I take full credit for it. I just had a question for Alyssa. What advice would you give? We've got uh, future sea wolves here in the audience. What advice would you give to them? Um, I would say to recognize that college in general, but going to Stony Brook is challenging, but it's far more rewarding. Um, and, you know, I would say to take advantage of what Stony Brook offers. Um, you know, as we've been talking about with the whole digital intelligence course and the digital humanities, Stony Brook offers, you know, a lot of different paths in which you can take. And I think it's important to immerse yourself in as much as you can, because you can definitely pull a lot from this university. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you feel like Stony Brook's the right fit for you, which I hope it is, um, just know you won't regret it. I as I said before, this was a great decision on my behalf and I'm happy I came here. Your cousin was right, I think. It is an IV education at a SUNY Price. We well, a, uh, do you have another question? Okay. A couple more popping in. Uh, let's see. Um, so what resources um, do we have here for students who need um, to improve their writing skills? We have a writing center. So in addition to there being as part of the general education, um, a, a writing course, 
that nearly every undergraduate takes. It's probably the one course on campus that I think every single undergraduate takes. Um, and those are small courses, about 20 students. So really good uh, faculty student interaction there. The Writing Center takes on the, the role of helping students with specific aspects of their writing. So I have sent my students there to say, work on this one page research proposal and make sure that they give you um, guidance on how to make this clear to a general scientific audience, right? So pick your audience and then how do you work on constructing that? What are some of the algorithms? I don't know, Alyssa, if you've been to the writing center, you're nodding a lot. So <laughs> I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you wanted to add something. Um, obviously just being a humanities student, I'm in the humanities building all the time. Um, it actually was a position, uh, I, cause you can apply to be a tutor in the writing center that I was going to take up, but I, had another position lined up, whatever. Um, but I actually, there was a writing center in my high school, which I worked in. So I just know that um, the tutors, they have a, cause I learned a lot about it. They have a whole training course they have to go through. So when you're paired with a tutor, you know, they're there to help you. They're well-equipped. Um, I have some uh, STEM major friends who have gone. Um, and I've actually had some friends come to me and say, can you read this? And I'm like, you know, I think it actually might be more helpful to go to the writing center just because they have like, you know, a disciplined way of doing things and have the proper tools. Um, so. But you made a good point that you get one-on-one -on -one help at the yes. writing center by yes. scheduling appointments and, and having a one-on-one -on -one interaction, which I think I left out. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And just to add for the audience, you know, we have a chemistry learning center and a math learning center and biology where are staffed by a lot of in, uh, undergraduate TAs who have taken these courses in the past and they go through training in order to help students as well as graduate TAs and the faculty. So it's really a whole team who's helping students through um, both the, the big science classes as well as these um, smaller humanities introductory classes. So there's a lot of on-campus help. The all, everything I'm talking about is free. Um, you know, those, the student, the TAs in those learning centers and the science classes hold review sessions, um, multiple review sessions before exams. Um, so it's a very supportive culture in that aspect. Um, no, not to say that the courses are easy, but uh, there's a lot of help out there in addition to the academic advising that happens both centrally and within the departments for the majors. Um, you can come into Stony Brook, into the College of Arts and Sciences as an undecided major, um, which is, believe it or not, a pretty large group of students who come here to find out um, what they figure out what they want to major in by taking some of these introductory courses that Alyssa mentioned. Uh, you are asked to declare a major in your first year so that you could be advised and, and told what to do, but we've had a couple of questions. It's, it's possible to change your major, um, again, unless you're trying to change into something like computer science. Well, now if you're uh, an English major and you don't want to be a teacher and you don't want to be a writer, uh, what are some other career paths you've seen uh, English students go on to pursue? Oh gosh, we've had people go on to work with video game companies. Um, you have video games also have stories. They follow, you know, something called ludology, which is how games work and narratology, which is how narratives work. And we study both of those things in an English department. I've seen students go on to be uh, social media advisors for politicians. I've seen students go on to, um, uh, a lot of students go on to, uh, go, go on to teaching one. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a popular program at Stony Brook. I've seen students go on to med school. Um, there are a lot of different directions that you can take an English major. Um, Law school. Even the internet yeah. itself has a basis in text, you know? not just in numbers on the binary level, that's machine, you know, machine code, but the basis in text. 
also just to that point, I know that um, the person posing the question said they don't want to be a teacher. I just received an email three days ago from the English advisor with a Google spreadsheet that probably had 200 positions on it, full-time positions after you graduate um, with a plethora of varying opportunities that you could, you're a great candidate for purely if you're an English major. And um, there were a lot, which Professor Graham just mentioned, but so many things I wouldn't even think that people would want an English major. Um, there's a lot of value in the major itself. So you can go a lot of directions with it. I've seen kids go on to work at book publishing. I've seen kids go on to, uh, to become, I, I've actually asked a lot of tech companies specifically what they want out of English majors because I'm always interested in teaching classes for English majors that maybe help them if they're interested in, in working in that field. They always said, oh, we would love English majors who, who can analyze data and like analyze novels and stuff, use it. but we never get anybody like that, which is too bad because there's a very particular kind of analyzing things that you learn when you're studying texts. We don't get people who do that kind of nuanced analysis. So if you took some classes in um, data science and additionally the, you were an English major, then being an analyst of that kind, you could take it to a lot of different kinds of organizations. Everybody has masses and masses of data that need to be analyzed. Um, uh, Alyssa, on, uh, here, here's a good question for you. Um, some, some a student wants to know socially, what is the student life like? Uh, so if you can provide a feel for, for the environment that um, a student can expect when coming uh, to the university as a student. So I'm actually in a position at Stony Brook where I'm socializing with people all the time. Um, obviously now primarily in an online format, but I'm a resident assistant. Um, so I work with you know, my peers all the time. Um, I, I know in the building, we put on a lot of events. In the quad, we put on a lot of events. Um, and, you know, different organizations put on events that are geared towards residents and commuters. Um, as if you don't know, Stony Brook is, you know, a very good mix of commuters and students that dorm. Um, and I have found within the social life that, there's so many clubs, I swear, I, there might be hundreds, I don't know, I, like honestly, there's so many. <laughs> and you can really find your niche, niche here. Um, it's just a matter of literally reading through a website which has hundreds of clubs listed um, and you can find exactly what you want here. Um, making friends, you know, just from like a, a human being standpoint, there's so many people here. There's like, what, like 20,000 or so. You're gonna see some of the same people, but a lot of people you might never see, you'll see them in passing and never see them again. Um, but I've made a lot of great friendships here. There's a, lot, a huge pool of people to meet um, and especially going to clubs and you know, finding yourself in different positions will give you an opportunity to meet others. Um, and also- I would just yeah. I was, I was just going to add the campus record. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go, 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 go. I was just going to add you, uh, campus, we have a great campus recreation center with, you know, weight room and indoor track and all sorts of uh, physical activity as, you know, uh, locale as possible as well. I think the other employees can attest walking across campus, you're always seeing kids either throwing Frisbee or they're doing like, like they'll get together and they do acapella um, in, maybe in the early evening or uh, they play that game where you have like a little trampoline and that ball that bounces. What is that game? But you know, you always see groups of kids doing traditional classic college things over the campus. It's kind of nice to watch. Here's a, a good question. I, and I'm interested to find out the answer if you guys know this. If I were to be in Stony Brook, can I receive um, funding for a certain type of research or even studying abroad? Are there programs that exist for this? Uh, so two uh, very distinct activities and the answer to both is yes. Um, there are quite a wide range of study abroad opportunities. Um, 
and I can in a minute post a link to to them. And in and sometimes depending on the area or the country, there might be um, scholarship money available to help with that. And then in terms of research, um, most of the funding for research is to do research during the summer, during the academic year, it's for credit towards your degree. Um, and there are internal monies as well as external monies. So we, you know, a lot of our students apply for um, national fellowships and, and win them and use those to do research, as well as there are federally funded research programs through the National Science Foundation um, funds positions as well. So there are a lot of opportunities. The uh, um, name of the summer program, I'll put it in the chat box, is Eureka, Undergraduate Research Experiences and Creative Activities. I think that is what it stands for. Um, and that's really the umbrella of everything from the art final project research type to working in a chemistry lab. And there are a lot of activities associated with that. So I don't see any other questions. Um, I guess if, if any of the panelists would like to each give like a, a nice piece of uh, wisdom or advice for these students who you know, they've got, um, they've got about two and a half months, I guess, till May 1st to make what could be a tough decision. So um, I'm sure they've got a lot on their minds. So uh, maybe a nice piece of wisdom to help them sort through what could be a very uh, complex process. Let's go in descending order of wisdom, starting with Nicole. <laughs> um, well, first of all, we really hope that we see you in the fall. And let me answer a question that if there are any parents out there maybe asking is what will fall 21 look like in a pandemic? And um, our plan is to be in person. Um, we have uh, a very, we can look at the Stony Brook COVID dashboard. Uh, the campus has been very safe. Uh, we are doing surveillance testing twice a week of students and of all faculty and staff on campus. Um, and we have very compliant, um, set of students and faculty and staff in terms of social distancing and masking, et cetera. As, and New York, like all states, has started vaccination. And so in New York State, um, in-person instructors are um, uh, in phase 1B to be vaccinated. And we're very hopeful um, with what's going on federally that the majority will be vaccinated by the end of the summer. So that's where we are, as we've learned over the last year, things can change, but that's our current planning. And um, I think things have gone pretty well in terms of what percentage of the student body are present on campus. You can see that on the dashboard as well. The dorms, I think are a little over half their normal capacity. Um, many of our classes are online, but students are taking those classes all over campus. We have a brand new student union um, with great Wi-Fi, students hang out in the library. When it's nicer, they hang out on the Stoller steps and take classes and play Frisbee at the same time. Um, so that's, that's how it's been working this year. So I'll stop there. Um, I guess my imparting wisdom would be obviously to make the decision that is best for you but of course I do encourage coming to Stony Brook because obviously I believe it's an excellent place for a variety of students most students um, and I just wanted to mention that you know Stony Brook has such a diverse student and faculty populace which I find is very beneficial to the social experience, the academic experience. Um, and I just wanted to touch on that because I feel like that brings a lot of value. Um, and I wish you all the best as admitted students and I hope to see you in the fall. Lyle, why don't you go ahead? 
Um, sure. Well, well, from an admissions perspective, you know, we've been working with the students, um, you know, right from the get-go, some for as many as two or three years as we meet them at college fairs, uh, at high school visits, over the phone, uh, through online chats. So it's very exciting. So you've gotten to a point now where all this hard work has paid off. You've gotten into a great school with great people, as you can tell. And over the next two months, we're gonna be doing more programming like this to give you as much information as we can to try to help you make this, uh, what could be a very difficult decision. And um, you know, it's a, a very exciting time. So enjoy each and every moment of it. Am I up? Yes. Um, I've, I've been on a lot of different kinds of campuses. And one of the things that I've learned over time is that fit is a real thing. Um, I've been in places where I felt that I fit well. This is one of them. And I've been in places where I thought, oh, okay, this, I really wanted to be in this place. But now that I'm here, I see it's not. But the nice thing about Stony Brook is that um, it's capacious enough that you can have the kind of experience that you want to have. If you want to have a small college experience, you can have that all of the way through. Um, if you want to have a big research university experience, you can have that all of the way through. Um, fit is a really easy thing to make for yourself at Stony Brook. And it's something that's impossible to find at a lot of other places. If you aren't, um, if you aren't, uh, you know, if you aren't exactly the type of peg for that particular kind of place. So just on the level of feeling um, safe, happy, comfortable, excited about the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, fit matters. But um, as I said, fit is a really easy thing to find at Stony Brook. And it's one of the things I love best about the place. Very nice. Um, so I guess at this point, um, that brings us to a close. Um, I would like to thank the panelists very much. Alyssa, Dr. Sampson, Professor Graham, all for uh, providing such good insight. And we want to thank all the students as well for giving us those good questions to work with. And uh, like we said, you got, you got a lot of uh, good stuff to look forward to. And we wish you all the best. Take a look at the links. Um, as you can see, um, there are some good talks with uh, Dean Sampson that you can check out on that link. So everybody have a great rest of the day and we'll be in touch real soon. Everybody take care. And thank you, Lyle, and your team for making this evening possible. Take care and be safe.